Before we can have a home, we must first build a house, one with a strong roof, sturdy walls, and good floors. But before we can build a house, we must first earn the money for it. Through hard work, of course, through years and years of overtime, through promotions and numerous job well dones, and for some, through blood, sweat, and tears. How long should one wait, though, with the National Home Mortgage Finance Corporation? Not too long, because it should never take too long. The National Home Mortgage Finance Corporation, or NHMFC, is a pioneer in the development of secondary home mortgage markets. Created in 1977, NHMFC was envisioned to increase the availability of affordable housing loans. It was created to give Filipino banks and developers the resources to build the homes Filipinos need. Countless Filipino homes, homes they will share for generations to come. Through NHMFC's unique way of converting mortgages into marketable securities, funds for housing increase throughout the years. So having a house that's truly yours happens faster. Especially now with innovative programs such as HLRPP and Bahai Bonds 1 and 2. Through these creative offerings and a commitment to constant improvements, our vision becomes a reality. To be able to provide funds to home borrowers in a timely manner at reasonable terms. So that roofs can be built, those walls can be put up, floors can be installed, and memories can finally be shared. Stories can be told, laughter can abound, love can grow, and families can flourish. Indeed, we are your partners in making that dream house a reality. Because every Filipino deserves a house. The National Home Mortgage Finance Corporation. Every Filipino deserves a home. And it shouldn't have to take too long. For housekeeping, this webinar will be recorded. Screenshots, video and audio clips will be used to report of the event on internal channels of CFA Society Philippines and possibly online website and social media platforms. If you do not consent to the internet use of video or audio clips in which posts from you might be visible, please email us at eventscfaphilippines.org. No other recordings of any form are allowed once you enter the webinar. Please note that CFA Society Philippines holds proprietary rights on all the presentation materials of this webinar. Kindly mute your audio when not speaking to prevent any background noise. Please write your questions to the speaker in the QA box. Good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the Digital Wealth Management Webinar. Thank you for being with us today. My name is Rochelle Sampang Manaog, Program Director of CFA Society Philippines, and I am your host for tonight's event. We would like to take this opportunity to recognize our annual corporate sponsors, Platinum Sponsor, National Home Mortgage Finance Corporation, Bronze Sponsor, Seal Philippines Incorporated, and to formally welcome us all, may we please have the President and Chairman of CFA Society of Philippines, Dr. Robert Ramos, CFA, Kaya, CIPM. Good afternoon to all of you, and thank you for attending this webinar. During these times, it's always very interesting to keep on learning. This is one thing that I believe is very important to learn. Having digital solutions and at the same time managing wealth is at the core of our being CFA charter holders or potential CFA charter holders. I'd like to thank our guests for taking time out and giving us uh, this short webinar and further developing our knowledge on the digital capacities of wealth management. Again, thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you, Dr. Robert Ramos for the warm welcome. And in this session, we will hear the experts of Swiss 
headquartered additive, a leading wealth tech platform for the global wealth industry to understand wealth tech trends and technologies, critical lessons learned and innovative use cases, demonstrating how banks and their wealth managers can de deliver success through digitization. Without further ado, may we call on the Senior Sales Manager of Additive, Mr. Victor Wong Son Negero, GM Asia Pacific of Additive, Mr. Kevin Hardy, and Head Strategic Sales of Additive, Mr. Peter Zilstra. Michelle? Welcome, Kevin. Hi, thank you so much for such a, a warm welcome. And Dr. Robert Ramos, thank you very much for the opportunity to present uh, to the CFA Society of the Philippines today. Uh, my team and I uh, have pulled together some information and hopefully, we, hopefully this will be a very uh, active session uh, for you all. The purpose of today, similar to Dr. Ramos's comments, is for us all to take the opportunity to learn. Uh, at Additive, we believe in being lifelong uh, students uh, and, and this, the, the form of being a student can take many, many shapes. Uh, and just having an opportunity to exercise our brains is, is tantamount to, to really developing and understanding what's going on within the space. Uh, you would have all experienced and noticed that the technology continues to move forward uh, almost without restrictions. And it now intercedes every part of our daily lives. One of the important things we think uh, within Additive is to really understand what that means to each and every one of us. And through a wealth lens in particular, because again, we're in the business of investments and understanding how, how these inter intersections work and what they really mean for us. So today, Victor, uh, my colleague and Peter will spend quite a bit of time really challenging some of the assertions within the space, really putting forward some really quite uh, pointed uh, pieces of, of information and thoughts and views on what's happening within the context of wealth and technology, both broadly, uh, globally, but also specifically within the Philippines. So it will touch uh, each and every one of you, and hopefully there, there, there is a sense of feeling as we go through this presentation. Uh, I also wanna encourage everyone to really think about questions. Uh, we do have a Q&A section at the end, and that's an opportunity for us to really exercise uh, some, of those, some of those curious muscles and to ask those questions. And if, some of you are a bit too shy to maybe ask during that time, uh, please do take an opportunity to follow up afterwards with us. We'd be delighted to respond. So without further ado, let me hand over to Peter, who will kick off with a little bit of an opener, as well as uh, just walking through the agenda for today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, thanks so much, Kevin. Um, just a quick uh, check if you all can see properly, or Richelle, if you can see the screen so that we know we're on the right one. Yes, I can see the screen. Excellent. So we've decided today, um, as uh, as Kevin mentioned, to uh, to share some uh, some views of what's happening with the disruption in the uh, the wealth management market, and we focus obviously on on digital. Um, I will first start um, um, 10 15 minutes with some new use cases. Uh, take a, a thirty thousand few thirty thousand feet approach to see what's happening in the world with the disruption in more or less uh, within the financial sector. Uh, then we will uh, zoom in uh, in the second part. Well, Victor will uh, will share a lot on on what's happening in the Philippines. What are new players? What is the disruption that's happening in the market? Uh, and also pose one or two dilemmas for the traditional, if I have to use that word, wealth managers. Um, and then uh, afterwards, I will zoom in a little bit about uh, additive and the solutions that we actually have. Uh, we've decided to focus on a couple of lessons learned uh, as the basis, perhaps, for uh, the Q and A that uh, Kevin already was uh, referring to. So without ado, let me start then with the first one. What you see is a quote, and some of you have probably heard of that quote. Maybe some of you have never heard of the quote, but uh, already 30, 40 years ago, it was mentioned by Bill Gates um, that you know banking is essentially, it makes the world tick, it makes the world go round, but not necessarily banks. Now, this is obviously a bit of a provocative statement, but bear in mind, uh, this was mentioned 40 odd years ago. Um, and what I've done is I've taken that statement of Bill Gates and I've added something to it from a book called Buy Buy Bank. Banks, a little bit in a, in a similar provocative fashion. But in that particular book, for those of you who have read it, uh, it actually mentions three separate phases which will happen to the financial system 
uh, and which obviously impact uh, the wealth management, um, not just wealth management, also retail banking, corporate banking, but for the topic of tonight, it will impact wealth management. Um, the first phase that is mentioned by the book is called displaced. And what it actually means is that the traditional way of engaging with financial institutions, the traditional way of engaging with your bank for that matter, will be displaced by new players in the market that have a better offering, uh, a better interface, for example, that can give uh, much more instant gratification uh, to the users. Now, the example I've chosen here to highlight that this is indeed already happening is a company that has launched four years ago in the UK, a company called Yolt. Um, what is interesting is that they've launched a platform that will allow you with one look, a financial dashboard, um, which you can access all your financial information, your various credit card statements, your bank accounts, how much you have at any given time at any of these particular bank accounts. And aggregate all that information into a platform and then push it through the mobile application. Now, what does this allow you as an example? It allows you something that the other banks can never offer because as a bank, you can nev never offer the information from your competitor, of course. But strangely enough, YOLT is. YOLT is able to get with the consent of the users, of you and me, they're able to aggregate all the data from all the different bank accounts and put it into a nice display. Um, the reason why this is possible is something that is called PSD2 and open banking. These are regulatory frameworks in Europe and in the UK that will actually allow this type of information to be shared and to be aggregated. And as you can see, uh, there are multiple benefits uh, by having uh, this, this account in your pocket almost because the alternative, let's imagine the alternative would be you would have to go to three or four different websites or mobile applications, use two or three different usernames and passwords, and then probably end up with a little piece of paper writing down how your financial health would look like today. So this is a, a nice new use case that is uh, coming up across the world, but uh, in Europe, because of the regulatory framework, it, uh, it has launched. And it is one example of what is mentioned in the book as the traditional interfaces of the banks, even digital, they will sooner or later be displaced. If we look at the next phase again in the book, and this is something that is very, very close at home in Asia, we, we all have experience with this, is where actually the banking role is going to be diminished, diminished up to the point that actually customers, end users, consumers prefer alternative solutions. Um, I've put two examples in here, which most of you will be familiar with, WeChat Pay and Grab Pay. Now, you might ask yourself, uh, Peter, we're trying to understand digital wealth management. Why am I getting, uh, um, you know, uh, an example from uh, a messaging application with only 1 billion users, by the way, WeChat or a Grab, uh, which is obviously a ride hailing application. What is happening is that all these applications in Asia, particularly, we do not see this super app phenomena in Europe. We only see it in Asia, have grabbed uh, multiple uh, millions of users and as a consequence are becoming financial service providers. Some of them might actually say these are the digital banks of the future. And fair enough, already a number of these players are applying or have succeeded in getting digital banking licenses. Because on top of the standard daily needs that we have, these apps actually recently, very recently, have started to step into a very attractive market segment, which uh, allows them to offer investment solutions. Now, this is maybe micro investments. Um, we could say this will not impact the, uh, the established order or the established hierarchy. Um, however, bear in mind that um, even though these type of, of companies, the super apps, are focusing on a new emerging market, uh, the lower end of the the market, um, nothing will stop them in their quest to actually ensure that they will grab also sooner or later um, uh, an increasing amount of assets under management. And this is again predicted by the book Buy by Banks that we will find new players that have a better interface. Um, and as a consequence, uh, we will find that um, the wealth management, the digital wealth management will look totally different in the years ahead than over the past years. So this is a, an example close from home. What you can also see is I've put in there some numbers uh, from a recent um, Tamasek study, Tamasek and Bain and Google, um, which was actually the uptake of these new uh, AUM 
uh, assets under management or assets under authority. And you can see that they predict uh, a significant increase in the assets under management, the digital, uh, using these digital platforms. Um, we see it with uh, Gcash in the Philippines, with Grab Invest in Singapore, with Gojek in Indonesia. Uh, we obviously have seen it already in China with um, uh, Alibaba, um, WeChat. So there is a significant amount of new players in the market that start small, but have the capability to very rapidly scale and scale with decreasing marginal costs. And that word is something we should remember because when we talk about the future of digital wealth management, um, it's actually the words platform and marginal costs, which are quite, uh, quite important. So again, an example from the book by by banks, and this was the second one, which we actually already see happening in the markets in Asia today. The third phase is rather disruptive, if I have to use the word. In the book, it actually challenges the core conventions, the core fun foundations of the financial system. Uh, and it shows with a number of examples that in the nearby future, uh, traditional cash mechanisms or even digital currencies will be replaced by more crypto type currencies. Uh, and this is a very, very dynamic and a very interesting area where we see lots of developments happening. The impact for the wealth management and digital wealth management is actually twofold. One, um, I trust uh, some of you, most of you are familiar with um, the actual cryptocurrencies, which are seen obviously as, as uh, by some as very valuable, by others as rather risky investment. But what is more interesting for our analysis is actually the underlying technology. And the underlying technology of all the cryptocurrencies is what we call the blockchain. Now, the reason why this is relevant is that blockchain actually is a total deviation, a total di disruption from the traditional way of organizing information and organizing data. What blockchain actually does, it, it, goes, it takes away from a more centralized ledger. It goes away from the idea that somewhere centralized, all the data needs to be stored and that there are certain authorities that can regulate this. What it does, it pushes that regulation out to the actual users. So we call it the decentralized centralized ledger technology, and that will allow for a lot of new future innovations. Just to highlight one in the interest of this discussion, where we see a huge future growth for digital wealth management is what we call um, decentralized finance, DeFi in short. And decentralized finance, it's also predicted by the book, is already happening while we speak. Um, if we look at Hong Kong, there is uh, a company called Liquify. Liquify is well known to actually try to bring uh, liquidity into assets such as real estate, for example, because um, you know the issue with buying houses, not just skyscrapers, but the house next door perhaps, or if you want to, uh, to start a family, uh, you obviously uh, need to to secure funding there is that it's very difficult if you do not have sufficient money. Normally we would go to the banks um, and we would get uh, the mortgages, but in the nearby future, we could envision a situation where we will be investing in a part of a real estate, part of a property, a digital part or a slice of that real estate. The blockchain technology would actually allow these type of transactions, um, whether we would use it for our own residence or whether we'd use it as an investment. So what we're looking at, and this is a little bit uh, the future that we can uh, expect over the coming years is that large illiquid assets like real estate, but also our work of arts for that uh, matter, uh, are becoming available now to the wealth management industry using these blockchain technologies, allowing us to trade parts, minor parts, micro parts, larger parts of these illiquid assets. And that way we will liquefy these assets. So again, it's predicted in the book and it's already happening uh, around us. Uh, a lot of these prop tech uh, in, in venture capitalists speak, this is called prop tech. A lot of these new developments are actually driven by uh, these, uh, these prop tech uh, new ventures and a lot of investment is flowing in that. And we can expect that if we look at the traditional uh, instrument universe from the banks, uh, the equities, uh, uh, the mutual funds, the bonds, etc. that in the nearby future, we will also be able to get a slice of um, yeah, these uh, tokenized assets that we can invest in.
Just a couple of examples. I mentioned the 30,000 feet, but what we have seen is that already a number of these uh, developments, these trends, these new use cases are happening in Asia PAC. Uh, in fact, I would argue that most of these uh, initiatives are happening in Asia PAC right now because the competition is fierce. Um, where we see that in Europe, my first example is the regulator who drives uh, a lot of the new initiatives with the PSD2 framework or the open banking framework. In Asia, we see a little bit the opposite. The regulator is uh, following the market developments, following uh, the competitive markets and trying to base its uh, regulations on, on some of these new launches that we have just proposed. So that's it from the first part. Um, let's move on to the second part of our discussion, which zooms in more what's happening in the Philippines. Victor. Okay, thank you, Peter. So now I'll cover the disruptions and the dilemmas in the Philippines. Hold on, just like second. this. Okay. So as, get, as you can see, the COVID-19 has created a significant challenge for financial institutions worldwide and, and not just in the Philippines. And it has highlighted the need for digital transformation. And why? It is because client expectations have changed. So with social distancing and people not allowed to visit their banks and other physical locations to seek advice from the RMs or advisor, so now people requires real-time, seamless, omni-channel digital tools or apps in their hands for their day-to-day -day needs. And this include banking and investment as well. And this is especially true, I would say in Philippines where most of the population is digitally savvy. The pandemic as well has given first-hand experience on the importance of savings and emergency funds to type, to, to type through tough times. Thus, we also noticed that there's a greater awareness for saving and investment as a whole. For the workforce and wealth managers, remote work will be standard. Thus, you need a relevant digital tools to remain competitive. I mean, even if you go to places where cases uh, are relatively low, like Singapore, I mean, remote work is still uh, the norm now in Singapore. So. I believe moving forward, partial remote work will be the norm or the new norm. And another new norm will be the new habit wealth management practices, where seamless interactions and advisories can be achieved by client and their advisor remotely. And more importantly, of course, is to lower the cost of operation, especially during these uh, trying times. And all these can be achieved by embracing digital change. For the last point, you can see that the pandemic has uh, accelerated the urgency to launch new business models. At the forefront is the fintech and technology focused company, where they are able to go to market quickly with new offerings to target the various segments, such as the retail, the mass affluent, or even the high net worth individuals. And they're able to seize the market share from the incumbents. We have also seen various launches launches during the pandemic in the Philippines. For example, one of the successful launches was uh, Discartech, where they're able to sign up about 2 million customers within the first two months. And, and that was a, a huge success and a huge number to be able to sign up 2 million customers in the first two months. Also, we see that more and more clients are also investing through Robo. And what is Robo? It's basically an automated investment services as it is much simpler, it is user-friendly, and it's always available on your mobile app. So uh, it, in order for you to invest, it's uh, relatively easy. And this robot trend is uh, prevalent in the Southeast Asia region, especially in the emerging markets, where there's a lot of uh, new wealth being created. OK. And the golden question is, uh, why the Philippines, right? So why the Philippines is because in Philippines, there's a huge opportunity in the market, especially in the mass affluent segment. So to explain the mass affluent segment is basically the higher end of mass segment. And if you put it in numbers, it's uh, uh, you need to have at least $100,000 in liquid assets to be considered in this mass affluent segment. And this mass affluent segment is made up, is made up of relatively young professionals who are digitally native. Basically, 
uh, they grew up with smartphone and exposed to all things digital. Thus, the same thing they will expect uh, the same from their financial services as well. They are also more conscious about money. They save more, spend less, and this is why it, it can give rise to the mass affluent segment. On the bottom left, if you look at the recent BCG report, uh, it projects that the mass affluent in Southeast Asia to reach about 136 million in 2030, of which 50 million will be 40 years old and below. And if you focus on the Philippines, the mass affluent is expected to increase from 10% to 28% of the total population in Philippines by 2030. You can also refer to the graph in the middle where uh, in 2017, the affluent share is 10%, but the 10% of this population uh, hold about 39% of the household wealth. And in 2030, it is projected that the 28% of the total population will, will be mass affluent, but they will hold about 64% or two thirds of the total wealth population in the Philippines. So you can see why this segment is extremely lucrative and is actively being targeted by the financial institution and the digital disruptors. On the chart on the right, you can also see that this mass affluent segment, they are, they are very digitally engaged with 88% and they are much more engaged than the other segment in the market. And if you deep dive into the interesting facts on the report for Southeast Asia mass affluent, yeah, it might be a bit small, so I'll just read it out. Basically, you can see that more than 90% acquire their wealth as salaried professionals or by operating businesses. And 64% are under the age of 40. And 56% rose up from the middle class within the past five years. Okay, Peter, if we go to the next slide. On this slide, you can see the active user growth and engagement of financial and mobile banking apps in the region. Uh, Vietnam and uh, Philippines are the top two countries in Southeast Asia year to date for active uh, user growth. It means that the population, again, are very digitally savvy. Although you can also infer that a large part of the population is still underbanked or have limited access to certain banking services. Thus, once the app was enhanced with new features and functionalities, you can see an immediate uptick in the engagement tremendously on these uh, mobile banking apps. And again, it means that uh, there's a huge op opportunities in the market for the incumbent and for the digital disruptors. Okay. So in financial service distribution for the, for the digital disruptions, uh, we can see super apps or in Philippines more like e-payment apps have been launching new investment set services, apps like Grab, PayMaya, Gcash. These apps basically they leverage on their huge existing user base to offer new services. They can gain more market share and to keep the user as much as possible in the ecosystem, right? So they want to create that stickiness. And it's only natural that the user will invest through the, through the same apps once these uh, apps launch a new uh, investment services as they do not need to re-sign up and it's much more simpler to use the same app for everything that you do on a daily basis, right? As, and some of these apps like Gcash, I mean, you can even book a doctor appointment or buy movie ticket from the app itself. And for, for most people, all this app has become a daily necessity for them. It's a bit like the WeChat example in China. Other than the super apps, we also see an uptick in uh, digital banks in the Philippines. Some examples, you can see the logo there. You have CIMB and ING banks who pride themselves on being mobile first and fully digital. Some of the incumbents as well, such as uh, East West Bank, uh, they have launched uh, Como, which is fully, it, which is uh, it's a uh, full digital bank. But last but not least, uh, you have Tonic, which was launched last month, and they claim 
to be the Southeast Asia first fully digital bank, so, so they do not have any branches or any ATMs and so on and so forth. And you will be able to open an account in under five minutes through its app. And they can offer an interest rate of up to 6% per annum, which is uh, unheard of basically in the market. And I, and I believe the reason they're able to do that because again, they're fully digital without any physical location, thus their capex and opex are much, much lower. And all these services, are driving up financial inclusion in the Philippines where most traditional banks are still uh, playing catch up. Okay. And another factor that enables the, the agile and composable banking is cloud technologies. So from a regulatory perspective, you can see that cloud is permitted by BSP, by the Banco Central uh, Filipinas, which allow the use of public cloud services although certain permission will still be required for client sensitive data. And technically this is uh, good news for the financial institution as they can benefit from cloud solutions. And also it allow them to be more agile, to be more flexible, so they can have multiple offering, multiple brands with minor additional costs. And uh, more importantly, uh, there isn't a need for uh, hefty investment and maintenance of uh, data centers. The BSP as well has, uh, in November 2020, has issued a regulatory framework that recognizes digital banks as a new category in banking, right? So with this, we'll expect that there'll be more digital banks popping up in the Philippines in the near future. Last but not least, uh, additive platform is also fully hosted on the Microsoft Azure Trusted Cloud. Thus, Additive is well positioned to offer our cloud wealth solution to financial institutions in the Philippines that seek digital transformation to capture the mass affluent market. Okay. So before, for the past few slides, we have seen all the digital disruptions. Now we can touch on the true dilemma for the financial institution. So if you see from the foreground, you can see that Despite growing asset under management, uh, because more people are getting wealthier and looking to invest, we can still see a fall on ROA, a return of on assets. This is due to various re reasons. One of the reasons it can be due to lower interest rate. And also you can see that the cost income ratio has increased, which reduce cost efficiency. This is probably due to increasing competition lack of low cost investment and distribution channels and thus it will affect the bottom line which mean lower profit okay and one way to increase the aum while lower the marginal cost is for incumbents to partner with digital platform for various services it can be distribution uh, new offerings and so on to provide high yield services to the market and this will also enable the financial institution to remain profitable and stay competitive amongst the new digital disruptors in the market. And in the next section, Peter will show how some of these incumbents or financial institutions have addressed these dilemmas, and he will show some use cases to support it as well. Thank you, Victor. Um, what what was pretty key in, in the last slide. I mentioned platforms and Victor highlighted these marginal costs, which create uh, significant problems for uh, traditional banks, traditional private banks, wealth managers, because all the um, examples of new market entrants that you have seen, and it was shown in the slide already, are of course all cloud enabled. Um, and that allows them to actually drive down their operational costs significant. And part of these cost savings, they can offer uh, to sign up new customers. So uh, this is a significant uh, impact for the traditional industry that we see. Uh, and the wealth manager, the traditional wealth management uh, industry is really looking for platform players at this point in time, either through partnerships with the FinTech or by upgrading their own IT infrastructure. And those investments in IT obviously will drive the success, not just of uh, private banks, but also of uh, consumer banks, retail banks. 
Um, just a little bit then on, on additive, we spoke uh, uh, several times about the need for banks to drive down this, to embrace these platform technologies, to drive down these costs. Uh, additive as a company has been in the market for over 20 years, um, so it's not exactly a startup. Having said that, we do pride ourselves on a bit of a startup mentality. Um, what you can see is that there are quite a number of global clients uh, if you look at the bottom of the slide that have uh, uh, decided to, to start their digital transformation journey, uh, adopt what we call the DFS platform, the digital financial suite, uh, to either offer new services to an existing customer base, uh, offer new services to new market segments, uh, and increase the operational efficiencies. Um, what is quite interesting is on the top right bottom, um, obviously, uh, when you talk about uh, uh, playing in the wealth tech space, which is uh, what additive is, uh, there's obviously quite a number of, of colleagues or competitors, however we phrase it in the market. Um, one of the key things that came out of a research analyst report uh, two months ago um, was actually that additive is, is quite strong from its platform technologies, um, allowing uh, not only business model enabling and also technology enabling. And as you can see, that is uh, for most of these banks who are operating uh, with the pressure from the regulator, with the pressure from the competition. Uh, it is key, obviously, to have a digital wealth platform that will allow them to drive these uh, new business models, launching new business models. I briefly touched upon decentralized finance, but there's also embedded banking, uh, where there's a lot of uh, emphasis today in the market, uh, where you actually are able to, uh, to offer banking services to third-party distributors, like the e-commerce platforms. You want to purchase something, you can get an immediate instant loan for example um, there's also a lot on uh, wealth management as a service where banks are saying listen you know we cannot avoid competition let's partner with them we have the banking license we have the infrastructure why not resell part of that capability to new players in the market so we can see actually that the whole market structure of the finance industry over the coming years will undergo changes um, and what is key is obviously to have a wealth platform that allows you to make these business changes and it's supported from a technology point of view. Um, not, not so much a technology discussion, so I want to, I only have one slide just to share with you how these modern platforms look like, these digital wealth platforms. Um, what you can very much see, and that should be the first remark, is that uh, at the bottom of the slide, um, all the existing wealth management systems are left untouched. Uh, of course, there needs to be a significant amount of upgrading in order to allow for what we call the APIs, the program interfaces, to exchange this data in, in real time. Uh, but essentially what you see in the future architecture of financial systems, you will see three levels, the systems of record, in um, most cases, the existing legacy of the banks, uh, the system of interaction, which will be all kinds of digital touch points, some of them owned by the bank, some of them controlled by the bank, uh, some of them owned by fintech, some of them owned even by uh, third party brands. Um, and all of these future digital touch points will need to be uh, integrated within uh, the bank systems. Now, that is obviously quite a complicated challenge to be able to integrate all these growing uh, digital touch points into your, your standard architecture. So what the market is looking for is in the middle, we call them the orchestration layers from an IT architecture point of view. These orchestration layers should aggregate all the data from various sources, be it the Revinitives, the Bloombergs, be it the ERP or the sales and marketing systems, the core banking system, and actually aggregate all the data with proper um, artificial intelligence, with proper analytics, be able to push that data through um, the, uh, the customer uh, at the point of demand. If it's, um, um, uh, let's say, a young professional who wants to uh, check on his investment through the robo, or whether it's a very sophisticated investor who has a client dashboard. So that is a little bit the future what we see uh, in, uh, in the finance, in the architecture of, uh, of the finances, finance world, uh, and additive is, is very well known as, as mentioned earlier, the system of intelligence. Um, if we then look a little bit at the challenges uh, banks are facing in, in the remaining part before we move into the Q&A, uh, I just wanted to share a couple of examples of some banks, uh, why they have decided to launch 
uh, these digital transformation projects and what have been the results. The first one where we zoom in a bit is um, a well-known uh, Australian company. However, uh, this was uh, the Australian bank, Commonwealth Bank in Indonesia. Um, they decided to, uh, to take a big uh, leap of faith and said, we want to, uh, we see all these developments. We see the mass affluent market in Indonesia. We see uh, the competition coming. Uh, so they decided to actually launch uh, a new digital wealth platform, uh, the hybrid approach, uh, both benefit from the existing relationship managers, but at the same time have the cost basis of a digital platform uh, in order to, uh, to automate their service, to launch new services. Uh, that has been quite a substantial success. Uh, the DFS platform from Additive, which is, is powering the IT system, you can see some of the uptake, 25% um, new customers were attracted from the market, um, a 26 point improvement on the net promoter score, the NPS, uh, and also overall satisfaction uh, of the existing customers to be able to have uh, a tool in the pocket, in the pocket, um, in their hands, uh, which offers them real time visibility on how their portfolio is performing. Uh, of course, the old uh, situation was that you needed to engage with a relationship manager, you needed to contact the relationship manager. Um, it was uh, sometimes a bit of a paper based uh, system, um, but these banks, they realized that customers um, have this need for mobile, have this need for seamless and obviously want to uh, want to, uh, yeah. Uh, transact and, and buy and sell on the fly, so to speak. So this was uh, a huge success in Indonesia. This bank is now, one could say, leading this digital transformation uh, in the market. Um, we've also have uh, uh, interviewed recently the customer. What is interesting is that they're already talking about the next generation of functionality that they're looking after. Uh, Victor briefly mentioned that in countries like Philippines, in countries like Indonesia, there's obviously a sizable population that is unable to gain a bank account, uh, that is unable to uh, to have the paycheck or the utility bill to register for a bank. Um, but now with new technologies like digital onboarding, um, they are all banks are also able to tap into uh, a new market market segment using much more self-service type uh, solutions um, in order to allow for these, these marginal costs. We have a small video. I think uh, we still have a couple of uh, minutes left, three minutes video where the customer talks about how they want to use artificial intelligence. Uh, Victor, if I could ask you to launch the video, please. Okay, sure. Hold on. Hold on. Dengan dimunculkan smart wealth, Anda telah menentukan standar baru untuk industri wealth management di Indonesia maupun Asia Tenggara. Inovasi digital apalagi Bank Commonwealth akan keluarkan ke depannya? Ya. Setelah pengembangan Combank Smart Wealth dilakukan, ini kami dalam kondisi yang lebih baik untuk melakukan enhancement di dalam proses model bisnis kami. Dan juga untuk pengembangan lebih lanjut atau berkesinambungan untuk digitalisasi proses ada di bank. Dan kalau kita lihat saat ini yang sedang kita fokuskan berikutnya adalah penggunaan artificial intelligence atau AI, teknologi baru yang akan membantu nasabah dalam pengambilan pusat investasi. Nah, contoh apa yang sudah dalam pipeline kami? Contohnya adalah satu penggunaan tools di dalam Combine Smart Wealth untuk uh, menunjukkan hasil investasi sesuai dengan simulasi yang customer lakukan, termasuk juga tentunya hasil pengembangannya seperti apa, dan kemudian adalah uh, menggunakan custom alerts yang saat ini sudah ada, sehingga nasabah bisa melihat alerts sesuai yang mereka inginkan, sesuai dengan kondisi yang sudah di set oleh nasabah. Dan selanjutnya juga uh, custom view dari uh, nasabah access portfolio mereka, sehingga bisa dilihat antara uh, simulasi pengembangan Kontrol yang ada terhadap hasil investasi yang nasabah inginkan. Nasabah bisa milih kontrol tersebut untuk mendapatkan model portfolio yang mereka lakukan. Nah, lebih lanjut lagi, intinya adalah 
Bapak Menteri Wap ini berkomitmen untuk meningkatkan layanan yang prima terhadap nasabah kami. Dan itu juga sesuai dengan values dari Bapak Menteri Wap untuk bisa meningkatkan financial inclusion terhadap masyarakat secara seluruhan. Nah, kami melihat bahwa dengan adanya aplikasi ini dan pengembangan yang lebih lanjut dari aplikasi ini akan mendorong demokratisation dari produk-produk web management terhadap semua orang, tidak hanya nasabah-nasabah uh, yang memiliki akses financial, tapi kita akan buat web management, live web management dan lain ini terbuka untuk semua orang dengan menggunakan mendekatkan aplikasi Komis Matel. Let me switch back to my screen. So this is an excellent example of uh, a regional bank. It's not just, uh, it's not a big bank. It's uh, actually uh, a smaller regional bank uh, who is able to use technology and, and drive, uh, let's say, uh, new services into a new mass affluent segment, the one that we highlighted before. Um, there are other customers that actually focus more on, on the larger banks. Um, where, we, for example, we uh, we know from the UK the NetWest Group, which uh, is uh, is a large bank. It obviously comprises of uh, uh, various different brands. We talk Royal Bank of Scotland. We talk Coots, which is a private banker. Um, they have much more complicated uh, challenges when it looks with on the regulatory side, on the IT side. Uh, in this particular case, I believe there were 24 different IT systems that needed to be integrated. But the principle, as I highlighted earlier, as you can see on this slide, is all these banks in order to adapt to this new digital wealth reality uh, they will need sooner or later they will need to have this orchestration platform um, and that allows them to to be much more agile to be much more flexible uh, but also to avoid that pitfall of having these costs increasing as victor showed uh, showed before this is just an example we can make the presentation available if you share with us your contact details through uh, through cfa philippines or directly um, the last, uh, before we go to the Q&A, uh, the last actual uh, customer I would like to highlight is uh, a very traditional bank actually in Switzerland. Uh, you all are aware of the post offices. Most of the post offices in Europe have uh, uh, also a banking function. The, this is one example. They're, they're not the fastest uh, or the sharpest knife in the drawer traditionally, but Post Finance decided to, uh, to actually change this and to launch a new wealth management services uh, for a fraction of, of the traditional Swiss wealth management service. You can see here in the slide, it says the minimum amount is only 5,000 Swiss francs. That's almost the same as 5,000 US. Uh, and you can imagine that is far, far away from the traditional um, investment volumes we talk about when we when we think of Swiss uh, Swiss wealth management. So they have took a bold step. They said we want to lower uh, the amount that people can invest. Uh, their philosophy was that we can reach out to a much bigger uh, group of people who are actually able to uh, invest um, using this this post finance uh, platform that they uh, they purchased from uh, from Additive. Um, and you can see that um, they have uh, these figures are a little bit old until October last year, uh, but they've raised substantial amount of money out of the market. Uh, from a total new user group, uh, the mass affluent sector that we have mentioned uh, uh, two or three times during this presentation, um, and all powered obviously by uh, a digital platform, the, in this case the DFS, that allows for these costs to, uh, to go down. So that ends the presentation. I'm just looking quickly at we have uh, still quite a bit of time left for questions. I hope uh, there, uh, this presentation has uh, uh, shared a little bit uh, um, your, uh, your understanding, has helped you understand what's happening with digital wealth management from a global perspective, but obviously also in the Philippines. Um, maybe if, Rigel, if we can um, now go back to and ask for maybe some questions from the audience. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Victor, and also Kevin. The floor is now open for questions. Please feel free to unmute yourself or turn on your video to ask questions, or you may also type in our chat box, in our public chat space for your questions.
to our tech team, are our participants allowed to mute and unmute themselves? Also, turn on and turn off their videos? Yes. All right. Okay. For questions from the audience or our participants, please um, feel free to, again, mute, unmute yourself. And you may also want to turn on your video if you, if you want to ask questions. Or we can start calling people as well. We have familiar names. If, if, if there are no questions, we do have an opportunity to share a little bit how this robo advisory solution looks like. So just uh, in case we do have that uh, available uh, for the audience. Yeah, I think we can, we can do that. Victor, would you be able to share your screen? And then maybe if there are some questions after the demo, it's just a short demo that uh, allows you to understand how these, these future new robo solutions that we've spoken about several times for the mass affluent sector, uh, how they will look like. Okay, sure. I'll just do a quick one. One second. Uh, screen right here. You can see my screen. I'll just do a quick demo, maybe uh, maybe about 10 minutes as we have, we have limited time. Sure, and yes, I can see your screen. Ah, okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, just let me log in first. It's uh, mobile first, so if it looks like a mobile. Yes, yeah, we know, like in Southeast Asia, everyone is mobile first. Okay, let me log in. Okay, so I'll just show you like a sample user journey on how to uh, create your goal or your savings, right? So firstly, you have the dashboard, right? Where you're able to see your assets here. Then you can see the performance of your investment. Then you get a balance, which include your cash and investment as well. Then you can see the breakdown in different asset classes, different region and different currency, right? Then uh, if this is linked to your bank, then you'll be able to see your funds here. Then how do you create like a goal or investment is very simple. You can just click on create new goal. And then right here, we have sample goal. Okay, so for example, if you want to save for uh, for your kids' education, so you can click on kids' education. Then right here, you can uh, change the name. So let's say kids, a US education. Then here, you can type how much you wish to achieve. So uh, let's say just keep as 120,000 in how many years? 15 and your initial investment here, 10,000, okay? So all these can be fully customized. Then if you click on calculate my goal, then it will bring you to the payment page where again, it will show you a, a summary of 120,000 in 15 years, initial 10,000. Then the system will calculate that you need about $292 a month in order to reach 120,000 in uh, 15 years, right? In this case, we assume that you have done your risk questionnaire. So basically for a new client, they will, you will need to run through a risk questionnaire where it will ask you how much can you save uh, over a month and your risk uh, appetite, right? Then from there, the system will assign you a portfolio. So in this case, we assume it's a balance. Then here below you have the asset allocation, right? So this is where the algo works, right? So uh, for balance, you can see the asset allocation here. This is just a sample again, but maybe if it's in Philippine, then you might have a UITF as well. It can be included. Then if you click on any one of the underlying asset, then it will show you the performance of the underlying uh, product, okay? Then from here as well, uh, it's fully customizable. So let's say if you don't like this number, you want uh, to put it into a round number, 330, then you can see that the forecast will change as well from 120 to 132. Uh, then here you can choose your strategy as well. So let's say if you prefer something safer, then of course you can shift it to yield. Then about the focus will of course drop, will be lower, but you can try to shift it to growth, which is more aggressive, but it will tell you that it is not recommended of course to go above your uh, strategy, but you can see the forecast will jump tremendously to 180, right? So high risk, high return. So we just uh, keep it at balance. Then we click on continue. And then here again, then you have to choose your payment method. It can be from your bank account or it can be linked to others like a credit card, wire transfer and so on, so on and so forth. 
Here is the monthly contribution. Again, you choose from which account, then first monthly payment date. Then thereafter, you click on pay now. And then the goal has been set up for your the kid's education, right? So it's relatively simple, right? So where do you find the, the investment goal? It's here. It's still pending for execution. But let's say if you want to see the current goal, as a, this client has saved for a villa in Bali as well, then you can go into this goal. You can see the present, the client has saved about 6,000, which is 0.64% toward the goal. And he has he or she has about four years left. Below here, again, you can see the asset allocation. If you click on pass, you'll be able to see the performance in percentage or in the numerical value at the different time period, of course. Right then on the last step future, then here you can see uh, the current the current goal value is six thousand, so the final is uh, one million. But uh, with this monthly investment, the client most likely won't reach the goal. Here it gives you a prompt as well, unlikely to reach your goal. So what can you do? The client can uh, click on edit goal. Here, of course, you can lower the target amount if you want, or you can longer the target date. But if you're not sure what to do, you can always just click continue and the system is smart enough to suggest a few things to you, right? So it's either you raise your monthly contribution, you make a top up, or you can lower your goal target or extend the goal duration in order to reach one million, right? So here you can do one or multiple. For example, if you want to top up just, just 50,000, right? Then you recalculate. Then you can see here the monthly contribution will have dropped from 18, 1,600 to 17,000. Then in order to reach your 1 million goal, then you probably have to raise your monthly contribution as well. Let's say 17,200. Calculate. And then, yes, then you will, with that, you will exceed your goal by a bit, right? 1.28 million in uh, four years and one month, right? Then thereafter, you simply need to click on continue. Then it will the system will help you to rebalance your portfolio so that you will have your villa in Bali in, in about four years time, right? On the app as well, you have, uh, it works a bit like a mobile app where you have messages so you can be connected to your bank so you can talk to your RM and so on and so forth. You can have a chatbot as well. Then uh, under transaction, you can see all the transaction history that you have done, right? all the withdrawal, top up, rebalancing, then below here, of course, you can see your profile. Then you can see turn on or off your goal tracking and auto rebalance. So it's extremely flexible, right? Then I'll show you the risk profiling quickly. The, what kind of question they will ask usually when you are a new client, then it's usually look like this. How much can you save over a year? Then you just need to click through. How much reserve do you have? How will you describe your income, right? So with all those answers that you have done, the system will assign you a risk profile, right? Then when you create a goal, then it will assign you the fix or the yield asset allocation. Okay. Uh, there. Yep. Actually, That's there's a, yeah, there's some questions here yep. that were sent uh, privately to me. Um, one question is, how do the robo advisors assess the risk appetite of potential clients? I think you've you've shown um, some some something already related to that, but the question is mm -hmm. both in the willingness and capacity to take on risk. So, is it through what you have shown just just a while ago? Oh yes, as basically I've gone through it very quickly. So it will ask you like a certain question like how much. Uh, loss are you willing to take so let's say for example if you less, loss, uh, lose 10 percent, what will you do whether you will top up or you will sell off everything or sell off partially right so so with this kind of question there's an algo that will uh, determine what kind of risk category the client will place into all right so another question is will there be room for client discretion for products that utilize robo advisors and how well are the robo advisors welcomed by different countries in your assessment Sorry, I didn't catch the first question, but how how well received is Robo? If you see in Singapore, Robo is very, very prevalent, right? So in Singapore, a Robo is all the craze. So basically all the big banks in Singapore 
BBS, UOB, OCBC, they all have their own robo. We even have all the independent robo company in Singapore. You have at least more than 10 robo. So we see a trend where this robo will slowly creep, creep into the emerging markets like Indonesia. So as Indonesia, you can see that Peter has shown you the example of Commonwealth Bank. They have a robo as well. Uh, we have done some market research in Philippines. It's still not very prevalent, but it's starting to pick up as well, the robo. And maybe I can add some more color uh, to, uh, to that. The, um, in a way, what we've seen happen in the investing space is individuals wanting to take control of their own uh, investment outcomes. And I think since let's call it 2008 when the global financial crisis took place, there's been a greater propensity for people to, 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 to do that, right? To really manage their own, their own assets. But they've also uh, come to the conclusion that it's quite difficult. Uh, and so there is a need to find a way to make that a little bit easier uh, for them as users to, to really not only manage their assets, but do it in a way that's, that's almost symptomatic with the way that they operate themselves. So we saw the trend for the robos really start to kick off aggressively, probably in the US um, with a number of, of products uh, out there. And then it slowly worked its way around the world. So Europe has seen quite a nice pickup. Uh, Asia, as Victor mentioned, has seen quite a nice pickup in some markets, but we still see it's, it's relatively early. Um, and there's really two schools of thought about how, how this pans out. We've already seen in some parts of the world that robos have been acquired. Uh, by, by some organizations in Singapore, for example, they grabbed financial networks, uh, bought a company called Bento uh, in order to gain the necessary licensing, the technology and the client base. Uh, we've seen some, some markets, as, as Victor again said, that the banks themselves have created uh, robo products over time. And, and that's really how they've been able to, to build uh, a, a digital interface with their customers, a way to build access to new segments and to grow to grow assets, as well as most importantly, serving a cohort of clients. Because ultimately, um, many of us are in industry, are in organizations that serve a set of clients, be they retail or institutional. And through this lens, through the, through the, through the retail lens, we're able to service those clients uh, quite or, or extremely efficiently, should I say, through using robo technologies. As well as that, it's quite a nice way to be compliant at scale. So kind of looping back to the, the earlier question, if you think about the onboarding and the risk management side of things, where you can codify a lot of what is required from a governance perspective into, in, into the tool, you've really taken away the burden that exists within a very manual structure. Uh, you've got it industrialized. And so importantly, when you think about what the BSP or various regulators across the world would ever ask for, you've got it in a nice neat format that you can extract at any time. So not only is it beneficial for the individual, from an organizational perspective, it gives you a lot of leverage and a lot of scale and a lot of optimization. Hopefully that helps to, to answer the question. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Victor. Um, we have another question. It says, um, I'm quite intrigued with the features of YOLT. Would you know how it makes profit? Also, do other developed countries have the same platform? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, essentially, what you see is um, uh, these aggregators, because by the end of the day, what they are, super apps, uh, aggregators, have multiple revenue streams. Um, first and foremost, they obviously try to offer uh, very valuable services to their end customers, their user base, uh, based on a freemium model. So that will mean mostly 70, 80% of those will be free, uh, but there will be an X number of customers who say, you know, I want these notifications or I want that personalized dashboard. So I'm willing to pay an X amount of dollars per month for that. That's the first revenue stream. What you also see is obviously they are offering um, uh, a very variety of, of curated services and those curated services come from fund managers, asset managers, etc. So they're able to gain some commissions, whatever they are able to resell. Um, that's a second revenue stream, uh, a B2B type revenue stream, so to speak. Uh, the third one is uh, they gain an enormous amount of insights uh, and analytics. And these analytics in today's economy are also worth something. So they're able to resell some of these analytics 
um, to back to to their customers, back to the B2B um, customers, uh, to allow them to actually understand how these new services, these new digital channels will work. Uh, what we also see is that they're driving into employee type uh, arrangements. So they contact large uh, customers, large employees and say, listen, you know, uh, we have a special offer for your employees. They might want to, instead of getting uh, the full salary, they might want to invest uh, a part of that uh, monthly salary package into some uh, uh, investment instrument with, with you know, minimum risk, for example. So there's, in all fairness, there's multiple revenue sources that we see happening in the market. I Thank hope you, that Peter. answers the question. Thank you, Peter. Uh, another question is because this is technology based, um, is there a possibility for it to collapse and how secured is it? I'm, I'm not sure uh, how to answer that one. Um, I think if if you are a bank and you're looking at uh, moving a part of your digital transformation, yes, it, it, it obviously pays off to ensure that you have a proper uh, vendor selection process in place. Um, and obviously a number of the more references uh, that you um, that you can find with some of the vendors, uh, obviously the more credibility it will get because a lot of these banks have taken the same uh, decision. They want to ensure that whatever they offer to their customers is scalable, is secure, uh, will not have any, any security breaches, you name it. So I would always recommend uh, do proper homework. Um, I briefly alluded to that report that was mentioned. That is an evaluation of, I think, 15 different wealth tech. So for any private banker who is in the audience and who has an idea to, to work partner by a digital banking platform, uh, that uh, market map, I think it's called market map, is publicly available. Um, obviously, the full report, the vendor evaluation uh, is, is, a, is a commercial uh, uh, offer, but uh, I think all the details and all the evaluations, also from the security side, are in that report. So one could do worse than, uh, than study that report. And if I can just to add a bit of color on the security side, it's, it's a very common question that comes up uh, and, and quite rightly it should be. And for us, we look at security very seriously through a number of different lenses. But I'll, I'll probably answer that very, very quickly because uh, there's, a, there's a very practical answer to, to this. And it really speaks to cloud-based technologies and, and how they operate. But also, more importantly, the sort of um, access to capital to be able to secure a platform. And Microsoft, uh, as well as being one of the largest companies in the world, probably has very, very deep pockets, uh, much deeper than many organizations that, that, that we've ever worked for, uh, to be able to secure its infrastructure. And so much so that it's been able to procure uh, clients from you know, many, many walks of life. So. The uh, US government, for example, is a big user of, of Microsoft Azure, uh, as, as, as you may have seen fairly recently with the um, much contested uh, arrangement that they have against, against AWS. But in the financial services space, some other large organizations have been users. So we've seen in, the, in, in asset management, uh, the largest asset management in the, in the world, BlackRock has recently migrated some of its assets across uh, onto the Microsoft Azure platform. And within the banking space, one of the most prestigious banks in the world, UBS, uh, has satisfied itself that it's been able to, 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 to step up to the sorts of rigor that is required from a security perspective, not only for their private banking network, which is probably amongst one of the most uh, sought after uh, networks in the world, but across this entire platform, across investment banking, across, across its investment um, banking divisions. And its commercial banking divisions. So it's been able to, the Microsoft Azure platform has been able to really satisfy a number of these, let's call them Fortune 500 organizations uh, with respect to security. So it's it's certainly the right question to ask. And we, we, we spend a lot of time ensuring as we work with them to understand what those security protocols mean. The other side of that is really from an organizational perspective and what that means from a security uh, security standpoint. And we see a lot of organizations wanting to put in place uh, single sign-on authentication. So once it's part of your infrastructure, whatever security protocols you have, it it, it steps through. And without getting too, too technical, um, there's a series of tokens that the user will handshake uh, with the applications in order to gain access to their own internal networks. So as well as looking at it through the, the Azure lens and ensure that the data is, is safe there, there's also added into that the features of your own organization to add that extra security layer.
hopefully that helps to, it's a very long way of, of answering it. And we could spend hours talking about the specifics of security protocols, which will probably send quite a few of us to sleep. But there is a, there's a lot of work that has gone into that. Thank you, Kevin. I think there are no more questions from the audience. But if you still want to ask, you have this, you still have an opportunity to ask the last question. If there's somebody out there who wants to ask a question. Well, I, I know it's always it's always hard to be to, to, to ask such questions, but um, what we will do is the following. If anyone has any burning questions, we'd be more than delighted to answer them. And, and hopefully alongside the CFA Society, you can help to, to, to send those, those questions through to us. We'd be very, very happy to, to answer any questions on, on your mind with respect to the future of digital wealth management as we see it, anything that we've covered today, or even anything that you're thinking about within the Philippines market. We're very, very open to, to have those engagements and discussions. And in, in closing, if I, if I may, it's been a delight uh, to, to be here today. It's, it's quite, quite an honor to get the opportunity to, to speak to uh, a number of, of the, the, the CFA members in the Philippines. And we certainly see this as, a, as an honor for, the, for Additive to be able to be here today. But more importantly, we hope it's been a real uh, eye-opener and an aid and a way to further the whole knowledge acquisition for the members of the CFA Society today. So thank you. Uh, we're probably standing between yourselves and your dinners. I, I, I know I've had my, my, my children shouting at me that it's dinner time a few times. <laughs> so hopefully uh, this, has been, this has been useful. Any questions, let us know. And if there's any topics you'd like us to present on, present on again in the future that has anything to do with digital wealth, we'd be absolutely delighted to come back again. So thank you all very much for your time. Thank you, Kevin. So be before we end the program, we request everyone to turn your attention to the screen as we flash the QR code for our online evaluation form. This will only take about two minutes. Do we have the QR code? There you go. There's our QR code. Can you scan the QR code and fill out a short online evaluation form? participants to turn on your videos for our group photo with our guest speakers for today. Can you turn on your videos for the group photo? Yes, please don't be shy. Um, Carlos. Hi, Frank. Hi, Robert. You're here. Hi, how are you? I'm Thanks pleased to see it. you. <laughs> And um, I think we also have um, Basil was here a while ago. Mark though isn't here anymore. So let's have a group photo for those who are willing to turn on their videos. Um, please join us. Uh, those who are willing to, to join us, please turn on your videos. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure everybody's willing. Come on, everyone, switch your cameras on. Yeah, so I'll count one, two, three. I think we have about two windows, one, two, three, smile. And the other one, one, two, three, smile. Thank you very much, Additive, Peter, Victor, Kevin, Sir Rob for being with us today, for all of our members. Ramat coming from Indonesia, and I think I see Siti. I saw Siti a while ago. Uh, he's from Singapore, if I'm not mistaken. So um, enjoy the rest of the night. Have your dinner, your sumptuous dinner, wherever you are. Take care and God bless. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Salamat. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.